Good morning, everyone. Great to see everybody that's here as well. Welcome to everyone online. Bom dia. We have a few announcements to get us started today. And the first one is that on tomorrow, Monday, we will meet together at 9.30 here for prayer meeting. If you have any prayer needs, you're welcome to give those to Peter or Rita or to submit those online as well. And then on Tuesday, we will have ladies' Bible study here at 11, and we are studying the book of Matthew. We hope you can join us. And on Wednesday night, we have Bible study for all, and it is here at 7 p.m., and we are studying the book of Daniel. Just a reminder to put your phones on silent before we get into the message here. And today we're going to finish Psalm 78. We've been on this for four Sundays. <laughs> we're going to finish it up. We're going to start in verse 56 through the end. Yet they tested and rebelled against the Most High God and did not keep his testimonies, but turned away and acted treacherously like their fathers. They twisted like a deceitful bow. For they provoked him to anger with their high places. They moved him to jealousy with their idols. When God heard, he was full of wrath, and he utterly rejected Israel. He forsook his dwelling at Shiloh, the tent where he dwelt among mankind, and delivered his power to captivity, his glory to the hand of the foe. He gave his people over to the sword and vented his wrath on his heritage. Fire devoured their young men, and their young women had no marriage song. Their priests fell by the sword, and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awoke as from sleep, like a strong man shouting because of wine, and he put his adversaries to rout. He put them to everlasting shame. He rejected the tent of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he has founded forever. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. Amen. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and have a word of prayer as we get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day yet again. Thank you for each person that is here today and as well for everyone that is listening online at your appointed time. Father, I just pray that you will be with us today. We know that you have prepared a special word through Peter. I pray that you would bless him as he comes and delivers this. I pray that you as well would open our hearts, open our ears. And as well, bring those things to mind through the week that you would have us really dwell on. I thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time together, the ability to come together and worship you. We do not have any constraints in this place, and I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for our freedom to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I will turn you over to Arise and Shine for worship. Good morning, everyone. Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ.
opportunity to love and worship you and Lord I just pray you speak to us today Father that you open our hearts and our minds and that you just um, bring a sense of peace on your house here Lord and I just pray for Pastor Peter for the word and just for your blessing on the whole service thank you Jesus Amen. Amen Good morning, everyone. And I hope you had a, a blessed week in the Lord. Today, we're going to be continuing in our theme of Easter. We're in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. The Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at our Lord's triumphal entry into, um, into Jerusalem you know, on, that, um, on that wonderful week, which ended in sadness, didn't it, when our Lord went to the cross. But as the Lord entered into Jerusalem, people laid palm leaves and their cloaks upon the floor. But as I say, at the end of that week, it turned from 
praising him to saying Hosanna in the highest to crucify him, crucify him. Then last Sunday, uh, we were brought together uh, to hear the message of the resurrection of Christ. He risen, he had raised, he has ridden, risen from the tomb. But there is more to it than just this, because if we just leave it there, it leaves us in a sort of limbo. So what was it that, that happened next? So let's go back and look in at more detail about the morning after the Sabbath. That sad day as the women made their way to the tomb of Jesus with spices to prepare the Lord's body before um, in his resting place. Now this journey must have been filled with such emotion as these women made their way to the tomb. It would have been a real struggle for them, not only because of the weight of these spices, but also the huge weight that they felt at the loss of their beloved Jesus. And it was not, he was not only their law, but he was also their friend. Yet these women would have been so intent and, and focused upon what they had to do for the Lord. They knew they had to prepare the Lord's body properly for his resting place within that tomb. And I would imagine, as these women would have been gathered together on the day before on the Sabbath, it was all that they could think and, and talk about. They would never have been able to do this work on the Sabbath uh, because by law, they weren't allowed to do any work whatsoever. And it tells us that even before the sun had risen in the sky, they were on their way to the tomb, well before the break of dawn. Now, although we can see in, in other accounts in the Gospels that there was a number of women who went to the tomb to prepare the Lord's body. But in this account, John chooses to solely focus upon Mary Magdalene. Now, when Mary made that sad journey to the tomb, and when she finally got there, she saw the stone had been rolled away. Her heart must have been thumping within her chest, because she must have thought to herself that grave robbers had come in the night and stolen the Lord's body. Now, before we go any further, let's look at and, and really understand the relationship that Mary had with Jesus. She was one of his inner circle of friends, wasn't she? But it hadn't, it hadn't always been that way. Because the very first time that Jesus met Mary, she was in a very bad way indeed. She was a woman who was possessed by demons, seven of them to be precisely. Yet our Lord, being as he is, took great pity upon her and cast these demons out. Now just think what this would have meant to, to Mary to be completely free of these demons. Before Jesus came along, this woman had no control whatsoever over her body or even her life. Most of her life had been possessed by these demons of Satan. But when Jesus came along, instantly everything in Mary's life completely changed. Jesus gave her the ability to, to move and to speak as she wanted to. So Mary really owed everything to Jesus because she was now free at last of these demons. But of course now she felt that Everything else had been taken away from her. She watched and she cried as her dear friend was whipped mercilessly with the flagellum. And then she had to watch him suffer the horrific death upon the cross. And now at her tomb she couldn't even pay her respects or help to prepare the Lord's body in his resting place. She was to say feeling completely 
helpless at this time. And also, we have to think about, because her friend was no longer there to protect her, she would have been very fearful that these demons may return and possess her once again, now that he was gone from her life. Now, although the risen Lord, of course, is really wonderful news for us, and that is because we can see the whole picture, can't we? But it seemed like nothing but bad news on that very first Sunday morning. And this was the terrible news that Mary brought back to the apostles, Peter and John. She came running in telling them, the Lord's body has been stolen by these grave robbers. Now, I know you won't remember this, you Americans, but in 1876, um, which is also a part of your history, an attempt was made to steal the body of Abraham Lincoln for it to be held for ransom. And the whole nation was completely shocked and outraged by this. So we can only imagine the shock of these disciples. They were already numb, of course, weren't they, by the unexpected death of their Lord. And when they saw and heard the hysterical cries of Mary as she came rushing in to tell them this terrible news, it would have been too much for them, wouldn't it? Now, the Apostle John didn't write this account until some 50 years after this event had taken place. Nevertheless, this would have been etched completely on his mind. Something he would never, ever forget. He would be able to recall every single detail of that day. Just like us, when something dramatic has ever happened in our own lives, we can recall the exact moment. We can recall every single word, the feelings we had. And this was the same for John. So let's read this account together in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark. And she saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down, looked in and saw the linen clothes lying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and saw the linen clothes lying there also. And the handkerchief, that, um, the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying there with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, he, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away to their own homes. <laughs> now according to, to other accounts of the same story, it was Mary that left the other women at the tomb while she ran to get Peter and John. And while she was gone, the other women saw two angels while they were waiting for Mary to, to come back. And the angels said to these, two, these, these women that Jesus had risen. But Mary, of course, knew nothing of this at that time. Peter and John, when they heard this awful news from Mary, they immediately got up and, and left their home and ran to the tomb. They ran through the streets of Jerusalem. 
Now John, who was the younger of the two, outran Peter and got to the tomb first. And he stooped down and, and looked into the tomb. And as he peered in, he could see the, the burial clothes lying on the rock shelf where the body of Jesus had laid. John doesn't tell us what really went through his mind as he peered into the tomb. But it would seem very likely that as he peered in and saw the burial clothes, it looked like Jesus was still there. And Mary had been wrong about his body being taken by the grave robbers. And maybe this was the reason why he didn't enter into the tomb immediately. But of course, that definitely wouldn't have been like the Apostle Peter, just to peer into the tomb, would it? When he eventually arrived, puffing and panting from his early morning run, he went straight into the tomb. And when he went in, he too saw the burial clothes which John had seen lying there. And he also saw the napkin that had been around the head of Jesus, folded and lying in a place all by itself. Now some people believe that this is the Shroud of Turin, which people speak about. And we've all heard about this Shroud, haven't we? And this story dates back as far as the 13th century, which has the, which has the impression of the body of a man imprinted upon it. It has the head, the torso, the limbs, and even the beard that has somehow been impregnated upon this material. And on this material of the shroud, it has the reverse image of a man, so it resembles uh, something like a, a photograph. And the features of this man are so clearly visible. And we really have to, to look in, in detail of what which John describes here, which would prove beyond doubt that this shroud of Turin could not have been the cloth that laid over the body of Jesus. Peter and John <coughs> both saw the napkin covered, uh, that covered the head of Jesus. And it was a separate piece of cloth from the wrappings that covered the rest of the body. And this is made very clear to us in the Gospel of Matthew because when Nicodemus and Joseph prepared the body for burial, they wrapped the body in linen strips. So it was not a single piece of cloth like the Shroud of Turin is. So based on those two accounts from Matthew and John, we therefore must conclude that this Shroud of Turin, remarkable as it is, of course, is not the Shroud that covered the body of Christ. Now we see from John's own account that when he entered the tomb after Peter, he saw the burial clothes lying there, and it says that he believed. But we really do have to ask ourselves the question as it doesn't tell us what it was that he believed. On reading this, we would assume that John believed that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead. Some preachers have even preached that the graves, grave clothes were actually lying there, hollow and sunken, as though the body of Christ had risen right through them and just disappeared. So they say that this was convinced John that the Lord had risen from the dead. But there is a big problem with that point of view because there isn't an explanation for what John writes next in verse 9 where it says, For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And in the NIV version it says, they still did not understand from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So this suggests then that John didn't believe that Jesus had actually risen. 
And there was a further clue to this a, a little later on. So what was it then that he believed? Well, he believed that Mary was right all along. Because when he himself first peered into the tomb, he thought that Mary had been completely mistaken because he thought the body of Jesus was still there. But when he entered the tomb and saw the body clothes lying there with a the napkin folded in a place all by itself, he believed that Mary was right and the body of Jesus had indeed been stolen by grave robbers. And also, I believe that if they did understand and believed that the Lord indeed had risen, I would have think they would have done a lot more, don't you, than, and they would have been so excited that he had risen instead of going back to their homes as though the grave robbers had indeed stolen the body of Christ. Now, we come back to Mary once again. She had also returned to the tomb following behind John and Peter, but of course at a more leisurely pace. But she remained outside the tomb while the two of them went in. Let's look at verses 11 through 18. Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, one at the head and the other at the feet, to where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said, now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. <coughs> This brief account focuses, focuses upon the weeping Mary, of course, standing outside the tomb, still convinced that her Lord was dead and his body had been stolen. Now, of course, when Peter and John came out, you would have thought that as they left the tomb and headed back to their homes, if they had truly believed that the Lord had risen, you would have thought they'd have mentioned something like to Mary. They would have said something like, Mary, cheer up. This is a time for great celebration. This is wonderful news. It's not a time for sadness. Let's go home and, and call our friends together and celebrate this wonderful news. But Mary was standing there on her own, and she looks at the tomb and sees these two angels sitting inside. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? But to Mary, as they were asking her this question, didn't seem to be looking directly at her, but looking over her shoulder to someone who was behind her. And so turning around, she saw a man standing there, whom she thought was the gardener. And he asked her the same question and said, Woman, why are you crying? This question was asked twice in quick succession, wasn't it? 
maybe it could have been some mild rebuke. The question is saying, this isn't a time for weeping. This is a time for great rejoicing, praise and thanksgiving. It also seems to imply here that she should have known, as Jesus has said on many occasions, that on the third day he would rise again. And one of the things that really stands out to us in all the Gospels <clears throat> is the deafness and the lack of understanding of the disciples. Jesus constantly tells them about his resurrection. But Jesus even had great difficulty in convincing his disciples that he was going to die in the first place. And it was only really when things started to come to a head in the Garden of Gethsemane that his words, maybe, they were coming true. But it seems that not one of them really grasped the fact that every time Jesus mentioned his death, he also told them he would rise again. And Mary was just the same as we can be. We can find ourselves in some sort of difficult situation or circumstance where everything seems to be crashing down around us at the same time. And even though we are Christians, we do tend to forget all the promises that the Lord makes to us. We start to feel sorry for ourselves. We become anxious and we become upset because of the things that we are going through. Martin Luther, he once spent three whole days in dark depression over something that had gone very wrong within his ministry. On the third day of this depression, his wife came down for breakfast, fully dressed in her black mourning clothes as though she was going to a funeral. Luther, because he was so absorbed in, in what he was going through, was taken aback by this and he asked his wife and said who has died maybe he had forgotten because he was so wrapped up in his own thoughts about the problems that he was going through his wife replied to, to Martin Luther and said oh God has died hasn't he what do you mean he says God has died God can't die well, she replied, the way you've been acting over these past few days, I'm completely sure that he has. Many of us have been caught in the same trap as this. And this is the same thing that had happened to Mary, but Jesus only had to speak one word to her. He simply says her name. He says, Mary. And Mary instantly recognize his voice just like any of us can recognize a friend or a loved one when we pick up the phone Mary threw herself at his feet once she recognized him and said Rabboni and she held on to his feet and began to weep tears of joy Jesus said to Mary that she wasn't to cling to him because he had not yet ascended unto his father and we know by other scriptures that 40 days would pass by before he would ascend into heaven and during that time Jesus would appear several times to his disciples in Jerusalem and on that very afternoon after speaking with Mary he would appear to he would appear to two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus and that same evening in a secluded room he appeared to the disciples, except for Thomas. He appeared to Peter several times. He also appeared on the shore of, 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 Galaxy, of, of Galilee and also to 500 brethren at the same time. Now, when the disciples had returned to Jerusalem and went to the Mount of Olives, which was 40 days after his resurrection, they all stood with Jesus and they saw him 
ascend into the heavens until a cloud received him out of their sight. It was then that Jesus ascended to the Father. But what was the reason that Jesus said to Mary, Mary, do not cling to me? Well, what he is saying to her is, Mary, a new relationship has now come into being. I am no longer going to be able to continue with you or the others in a close physical relationship that you have always been used to. I know that clinging to me, Mary, gives you great comfort, but it is no longer going to be that way because I am going to ascend to my Father in heaven. And as we know from the upper room where the disciples were, he would send the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, he would make him more available in a much more powerful and personal way than ever before. What he is saying is, when I ascend, my nearness to you, Mary, will be whole and complete. And Jesus says to Mary, go and tell my brethren this same truth. And this is the, <clears throat> and this is the wonderful, great news of, and the truth of Easter, isn't it? Because Easter is a reminder that there is a great and glorious hope that is waiting for all of us when it is our time to leave this earth. Because Easter means that because he lives, that we shall also live. This is the truthfulness of the Easter message. It gives us that great glorious hope when we do come to finally face death's door. However, at this moment, what brought Mary and, <clears throat> and the disciples gladness of heart was the fact that Jesus was back with them once again. He hadn't been taken away by the grave robbers. He was with them right now. But just think for a moment of how difficult it would really be to actually see Jesus in the flesh if he were here on earth today. Just think of the huge crowds you would have to get through to just to get, catch a glimpse of him, let alone be able to talk to him, to talk to him about your personal things. There would be millions and millions of people trying to get his attention, so none of us would ever get the chance to get close to him at all. So the good news of Easter is, not only can you get to know him, and that he can be close to us through every, situ every single situation and circumstance in our lives, because his spirit is within us. Because the risen Lord gives us a chance to, to share in his victory over death. And he is with us to take us through whatever it is we are facing in life. Some of us may be facing some very difficult problems in our lives right now. And maybe you think to yourselves that things are never going to get back to normal. And it's the end of, of all your hopes and your dreams and the things that you have planned. <clears throat> and through these problems, it causes us to have these fears and anxieties, heartache and, and real sorrow. But the good news is we really don't have to face these things on our own any longer. Listen to these words from Jesus himself. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will live with him and he with me. And that is a promise that millions of Christians have trusted in over the past 2,000 years. They have asked Jesus to come into their lives for him to dwell within them for him to go with them through their lives, through, ever, through every situation 
and circumstance. And to their joy, they have found it always to be true. And so, because he lives, we can face tomorrow, because all fear has really gone. And because he holds everything together, he holds the future. And so life is worth living, so we can live life to its real fullness, as God intended us to. All because he does live. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for your presence here with us this morning. You are with us every single moment of the day, every day of our lives, no matter what we are facing. You are available to us when we call out to you in our trials and tribulations. You always hear our prayers and lift us high above the stormy waters. You comfort our hearts and give us that special peace that can only come from you. Your resurrection has given us that glorious hope that one day we shall live with you in your kingdom in paradise. We also thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you pour out upon us every single day. So we praise and worship your holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we're going to um, have communion. So if you'd like to come to the, to the front and, and take the elements and take them back to your seat, we will take the communion all together. Thank you. Jesus, oh, you restore me. You restore me. Me. Let's just close our eyes for for just a moment before we take this communion together and let us search our hearts for the things that really should not be in them. Maybe our hearts are unforgiving, hearts that maybe have some resentment in them or for any bitterness we may have towards another. And let us bring them before the Lord and to ask his forgiveness for those wrongful thoughts that we really need his power to, for him to remove them from us. So let's just take a few, few moments of reflection. In the upper room, 
when Jesus was gathered with his disciples. Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he blessed it, and gave it to each of his disciples, saying, Take, eat, for this is my body. Likewise, after the meal, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did for us upon that cross so we can have that wonderful relationship with you, that closeness, that nearness. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your grace, and your forgiveness. And we pray, Lord, that we always honor you for what you have given to us as we walk with you in our everyday lives. In your name, Jesus Christ, amen. All it leaves me to say is have a very blessed week in the Lord, brothers and sisters. And God willing, I will see you next week. And I'll leave you with a rise and shine to, to close our service. Bye-bye. that I face stronger than the power of the grave constant through the trial that I face one thing remains one thing remains higher Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave A constant through the trial that I face One thing remains Yes, one thing Remain Cause your love never fails It never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails It never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails It never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails It never gives up Never runs out on me on and on and on and on it goes And it overwhelms and satisfies my soul And I never ever have to be afraid And one thing remains Just one thing remains your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up never runs out on me 
singing in death, in life. I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. And my debt is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Cause your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. I'm a child of God. 
Yes, I am. One more time. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we just pray for those that are not with us today. Um, those in the worship band that couldn't be here, Lord, we pray for their safety. We pray for their health, Lord. We pray that they are restored in you, Christ. So we thank you so much, Jesus, for your time here today. We bless you all, and we wish you a very anointed Sunday. Amen.